Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Tone Church. Uh, it's a Saturday morning, and I uh, recently, um, for the most part, finished up the Music Man amplifier, and I'm looking for something to do. I gotta say, that Music Man amp, I mean, a lot of times when people talk about solid-state guitar amplifiers, you know, they don't sound great, you know, saturated, they don't have great saturated gain tone. And, you know, they just kind of, like, try and be polite and say, Oh, well, it's a, it's a good clean amp. No, it's not being polite. That friggin' amplifier is a clean machine. That, it's a David Gilmore solo machine. That thing sounds amazing clean. And, um, I'm hoping to demonstrate that, hopefully, in the near future here. I've, I've been woodshedding and, um, trying to learn some stuff so we can make a little demo. But that thing is unbelievable. You can crank that sucker up if you turn the the um the first volume, the gain volume, the preamp volume down, keep it down low, but you crank the master volume, you can crank the shit out of that thing and peel the paint off your walls and it'll still be pristine clean. And um you know, I'm I'm a bass player, I'm not a guitar player. And I sure as shit am not a uh a soloist. But uh, I do know a couple little thingies here, and I, I was noodling around with that amp, and I started to play a little bit of a Gilmore solo, and it was like, oh my god. The Archangel Gabriel came down from heaven, and it was like, Aah! Your ego is astounding. Gabriel. Unbelievable. Clean, and clean with cream. But, uh, Anyway, we'll uh, hopefully get a demo up on that, and you can see for yourself or hear for yourself. But uh, anyway, got a few more things to do on that amp. I got to fix the Tolex and uh, a couple other little things, so I got to put an order in, get some parts here, and then we'll wrap that sucker up. So I was kicking around Tone Church, trying to figure out what do we want to do this weekend, and um, you know, um, I've had a my kitchen table's been covered in in amplifier chassis speakers and reverb tanks for like the past year and a half and the music man was one of them and i'm starting to see the bottom of the table or the top of the table the table's starting to clear out and i i kind of like that it'd be nice to have a kitchen table again so uh i grabbed this thing o over here i'm going to show you off the table because uh, this is one more thing we can use and uh get it off the table and get it into service so uh let me show you what we got all right here we are i'm trying to up my uh video production skills, and I'm using Mr. Tripod a lot more so we don't have, you know, shaky cam, and hopefully I'm not giving everybody uh, motion sickness. Now, whoever goes the longest without puking gets the last piece of pie in the fridge. Um, anywho, what we have here is a Grom's Little Jewel, I believe. Yeah, Grom's Little Jewel, and it's an LJ6. And um, when I bought that lot of amplifiers from the uh, the X music store owner, uh, he just threw this in. He's like, here you go, you can have this. But as you can see, she's in real rough shape. She's probably been sitting in a basement for a couple of decades, and chassis has got some serious rust problems, and it's covered in about... You know, 380,000 thick layer of uh, dust and rust. And it looks like you also started molesting the circuit. <sighs> so, and uh, finally the, uh, oh, look at this, there's no grommet here. Guys, don't pass wires through steel without a grommet. What are you thinking? Anywho, um, where was it? Yeah, circuit molested. Um, I could not find a schematic for the LJ6, or at least a free one. So I was thinking, what can we do with this thing? And um, it's cathode biased. So what would be a cool cathode biased amplifier that uses six V6s and a couple of preamp tubes? And um, well, I think we're gonna turn this sucker into a Tweed Deluxe clone, or thereabouts. It's got a 6X5. Um, so a 6-volt um, rectifier tube, so we can't use a 5-by-3 or something like that. But uh, that'll be close enough. But I think we'll, um, yeah, I think we'll uh, 
copy the uh, Leo Fender's uh, Tweed Deluxe circuit and um, turn this into an Ersatz Tweed Deluxe amplifier. I think that'd be pretty nice. These caps are completely toast. I measured them on the multimeter and they gotta go. Or they, I might leave them in there but um, disconnect them or not use them from the circuit. But what I think I'm gonna do is completely strip this sucker right down to the bare bones. And this is nice too. Everything is in with screws. Nothing's been riveted. So we'll peel this sucker down to the bare bones and we'll um, clean her all up, make her look nice, and then we'll build a Tweed Deluxe clone. Yeah, can you see right here? I don't know if you can read that. He's got um, the tubes that are supposed to be in here. And he's got 6X5, 6L6, 6L6. I don't know if that's what he was trying to build or if what he thought that's what this amplifier called for. But yeah, two 6L6s, no, that would... Uh, Transformers probably would not appreciate this. And I believe the little Jewel 6 has a uh, 12AY7 and V1, but whatever. Doesn't matter. We're going in a different direction with this thing. And we got some codes on here. ATC842. No idea. And, um... TO1C, Transformer Output 1C. Wonder what 1A and 1B are like. But uh, yeah, this sucker's filthy. All right. So if that all sounds interesting to you, I'm not sure why it would. But if it does, hang tight. Here we go. All right. She is all stripped down. Yeah, this thing's rough. Real rough shape. Here's all the detritus, all this crap here. So yeah, there's a lot of work here. I'm gonna try and recycle these tube sockets. So if anyone's ever um, desoldered wires and components off of tube sockets, you know how fun that is. Got a uh, miniature screwdriver here. Get yours on eBay. Um, here's the output transformer. And I check these with the multimeter and the uh, primaries and secondaries on both appear to be functional. So that's good because this is the heart and soul right here. This is the most important pieces of this whole thing. And uh, I'll check these knobs, but I don't think we're going to be able to use them again. But if they are in good shape and they're the, the proper values we're going to need, then we'll try and recycle them. But I think those are going in the parts bin. And then screws and nuts and bolts and more screws, nuts and bolts. Just a little uh, power socket receptacle. Good times. All right. So, yeah, now it's time to uh, start scrubbing and sanding and maybe we'll do some painting. Got the chassis all sprayed, painted up. With silver, I chose silver because it's the best color I had in stock. And I also got a nice uh, layer of clear coat on top of that. So hopefully we won't uh, suffer from any uh, chipping or peeling. Uh, I may go out and pick out some other paint color. Or maybe not, I don't know. That may or may not happen. But uh, it doesn't look great, but it looks uh, better-ish. Looks better than rust, put it that way. But, uh, yeah, that's fine. We like old beat-up things around here. Uh, just ask the tone nun. Anyway, um, I found on the internet Rob Rob has a, uh, point-to-point -point layout for a 5E3 Deluxe. So I think we're going to, uh, make a point-to-point -to -point Tweed Deluxe clone. So, I also think I'm going to, um... Order all the uh, special fancy brown resistors, the uh, carbon comp ones. Um, they generally have thicker, longer uh, legs on them, leads, legs, uh, which are more conducive to a point-to-point -point build. So I'm going to add to an order. I've been building on amplified parts for this, and uh, yeah, it looks like we'll get back to this in a week or two. But uh, hopefully for you, it will be in the next clip. So something to look forward to. Here we go. Okay, I just filled up my shopping cart on Amplified Parts, also known as Antique Electronics. And I'll show you that in a second. 
Uh, what is not in the cart is the stuff we are going to be recycling or stuff we already have. I have um, jacks in stock here, so I didn't need to order those. Uh, we're going to be, hopefully, reusing all the tube sockets, so I didn't have to order those. Um, I got MODs or mods for the uh, cathode bypass caps and for the uh, filter and res caps because the FNTs were like three times more. It would have been um, like $18 to get three filter caps, F and T. So we're going with the mods, which are like, I don't know, half, like one third the price. And uh, I have 25 uh, micro mod uh, bypass caps in stock. So that is not gonna be reflected in the shopping cart. And then of course, you know, we're recycling the transformers and the chassis and the knobs and but everything else you see here in yellow, all the resistors and capacitors, potentiometers, uh, we're not including the wire as well. I have wire in stock. But uh, if you're interested in doing a project like I'm doing here, this is how much it'll cost. All right, here is my project list. Here are all the parts. And some of the things we're going to have leftovers for you know, to put in stock, like all the resistors come in five packs, and we don't need five of each flavor, so those will go in the um, parts bin for later. But uh, there's your total price right there. $53.90. And if you shop at Antique Electronics or Amplified Parts, if you spend over $89, you get free shipping. But uh, this will be added to another order I was already working on, so I will have free shipping, so that will not be needed to... Uh, be added to the cost. So there you go. I'm going to um, send them some money and then hopefully in about a week they'll send us some parts and then we can continue on with this little project. See you then. Three weeks later. All right. It's been about two weeks since that last clip you just saw. Parts are in. I've been looking at this thing, you know, over the past two weeks and this silver just isn't doing it for me. So I figured what would be the most appropriate color for, you know, a uh, Fender Tweed Deluxe Clone. And then, you know, the answer was obvious to me anyway. Aw oh, yeah. Gloss Rich Plum. I'm going to have some fun with this one. Here we go. There we go. That's more like it. Looks like a Tweed Deluxe to me. Mother of meat. Mama mia. You've heard of Goldfinger, but have you heard of Purplefinger? My name is Priest. Dawn Priest. I think I just shot my pants. Do you think this power cord's gonna be long enough? Check this out. Just rescued about six acres worth of bench space by tidying things up a bit. We have uh, miscellaneous uh, gizmos and we have a box full of components ready to go back into circulation. Some wire bits, about $30 worth of reclaimed solder. This is great. Building amplifiers will be a joy now. So, let's build! Alrighty then. So it's been a couple of weeks since we began this adventure. And our parts order is in. So um, I thought we would do an unboxing video of uh, amplifier parts from AmplifiedParts.com. Um, unboxing videos seem to be popular. Do you believe $180 worth of crap fits in this tiny little box? I mean, shit, let's measure it. Look at that, it's eight inches. That's what she said. Yeah. Let's try it again. Four and three quarter inches. Ugh. Stuff ain't cheap, folks. But I do it for you. So if you like what we do around here, I don't know, maybe press one of the buttons down below. But anyway, or not, doesn't matter. I'm gonna do it anyway. crap out of here. This is packed for shipment, for sure. 
We got a nice little box here to fit our uh, vacuum tubes in. That'd be nice. Or some transformers. That'd be a perfect box. You want to reuse, recycle, and um, reuse. All right. No invoice? Where's the invoice? Come on, guys. Got to send the paperwork. The old staple here. Just like a box of Chinese food. Definitely don't want to swallow that. Ugh. Wow, they really use some industrial strength staples. Childproof container. All right, and I have parts for two projects. This uh, project we're working on now, the um, hand-wired point-to-point 5E3 Fender Deluxe clone-ish type thing we're doing. And also a uh, old Tweed Era Gibson app we're going to do probably after this. And there she is. Look at all this stuff. I did buy a bunch of um, ceramic 5-watt resistors of various um, values that we can use as output cathode bias resistors for uh, cathode bias amps. And then you'll also notice we bought the fancy brown resistors. That's right. I spent the money for the mojo. I figured these would be better for the um, point to point deluxe, tweed deluxe clone. Um, for one reason, uh, supposedly they do have all the mojo. Um, but they don't last as long as like a metal film resistor. They don't have as tight a tolerance and they can't handle as much heat. But they got the mojo, so you got to get them. And also they uh, generally have longer and thicker leads, which is much better for a point-to-point -point build. We got uh, capacitors, capacitors, and more capacitors, as they say here in New England. Got some knobs. Oh, this is for the uh, Music Man amp. There were a couple of knobs that looked like a Rottweiler was chewing on them. <laughs> so, we'll replace those. Tube sockets. Got some um, tube socket hole plugs. Uh, star washers. You know, everything you need. Wow, this does not look like $188 worth of shit right here. Jacks. Um, if you're into this kind of thing, um, for a while, and I, well, I started out buying the um, cheap Chinese-made Amazon uh, jacks. And, yeah, they, they just let you down. Spend the money, get the, uh, whatever these are, the Alpha Jacks. Or, uh, no, what are they? The um, Switchcraft. Pedals, amplifiers, go with Switchcraft or another uh, reputable brand. The uh, cheap Chinese ones are just not worth the headache. F and T capacitors. Got some orange ones that uh, that they have all that orange tone. Got some mods. Um, could have gotten F and T or Sprague, I believe, but the price on the uh, the fancy ones was outrageous. So we'll deal with the mods. Standoffs for a reverb tank and yeah. I also got a roll of uh, generic black Tolex to build the back door on the Music Man amp. That's it. $188 worth of crap right here. I need to find a less expensive hobby. Okay. Alright, uh, I'm going to organize all this crap and then we'll start building the uh, 5B3 Tweed Deluxe clone-ish amp. Here are some schematics and layouts we'll be using for today's episode. We have the original one straight from uh, Leo Fender's desk. We have Rob Robinette's layout to do a point-to-point -point build. Hopefully that's all in focus. And finally, I did a Google image search to see if I could find a schematic with voltages on it. And uh, one little uh, tip when doing Google image searches, um, say for instance, this example, uh, we're searching for a schematic with voltages. Um, don't just find the first image you find and print it out and use that. Go to the website to see um, the context of why that image was posted, you know, because this could be like, you know, someone posting on Amp Garage 
saying, hey guys, I got a great idea. Do you think this will work? And then the very next post will be, absolutely, under no circumstances, do this. Or you will uh, get electrocuted, burn your house down, and, you know, all sorts of evil. So, uh, just a little cautionary tip there. All right, let's get at it. Our little painting project is done. We got the gloss rich plum paint. Looks bluer in the uh, camera viewfinder. It's um, very much purple. And uh, we also did um, some accents on the transformers, as you do. And I know that, you know, the sample fire is gonna be for, it's gonna be appealing to a very limited uh, audience. You know, people that like Telecasters and the color purple. Can I play my guitar? But, uh, I think it'll be pretty sharp. So, I'm going to peel all this uh, masking tape off, and then we're going to do something else after that. Got all the masking tape off. Checking these out. I think they look pretty cool. That's the power transformer. Here is the output transformer. Let me get all that nasty rust off of there. Spiffed them up a bit. And then I uh, checked all the uh, windings to make sure there was still continuity and that nothing got broken with all the manhandling and everything looks good. It would be terrible to go and build this whole amplifier just to find out that I... Uh, Broke one of the transformers, but uh, fortunately that hasn't happened. Oops, sorry about the finger in the damn screen. All right, let's go. So I'm planning the layout here of how everything is going to fit together. The uh, output transformer goes here, the power transformer there. We're going to have a 6x5 rectifier tube here. We're going to have our two 6v6 power tubes here. And then uh, this will be V1, this will be the 12AY7, this will be V2, which is the 12AX7. And an extra hole there, and we had an extra hole here. I think I'm going to put my indicator lamp there. And that hole was just, just a little bit too big for the, uh, the lamp holder. So I hogged out a uh, washer, and that will fit in there nicely. So that should work. Uh, power cable, which we're just uh, repurposing an extension cord. And a lot of times this is a um, less than expensive alternative than buying a, a dedicated, you know, power cord. And um, here's some coax cable. This is RG174. And sometimes it's cheaper and a lot of times you can get it delivered more quickly. Uh, if that's a concern of yours, uh, if you just get, you know, one of these uh, cables and then just tack off the, the ends and use the cable for your needs instead of buying, you know, like a spool of uh, RG174. We get our potentiometers, we get another one of these guys, uh, which we don't need, and um, yeah, just coming together. Making some progress here, we have all the tube sockets installed, we got the plugs, the indicator lamp. And uh, some grommets for the output transformer. Um, guys, if you're doing this, do not pass wires through a metal hole without some kind of grommet. Either the rubber one, rubber style I have here, or they also make um, plastic ones that you poke through from one side and it has like a little hook on the other side that secures it in there. But running wires through metal holes, you need grommets. All right, so we're going to put the transformers on. And um, yeah, that'll be good. All right, this is where we're at. It's looking pretty fat. Nice. Got all the chunky stuff installed. Let me flip her over. You can look up her jacksie. Here's her backside. Looking pretty good. Got the power cable installed in my patented method. If I were to do this again, I probably would have moved this guy this way a little bit. Maybe this guy down a little bit. I don't know. I would have done that differently, but it is what it is. It'll be fine. And uh, I'm going to use this terminal strip to land the um, power cable wires. 
and then connect it to the uh, primary of the power transformer and uh, some other stuff we'll see we'll see as we get there got our fuse right here all our tube sockets installed we got our indicator lamp so now the fun part should be interesting point to point wiring point to point ish but no uh, circuit board of that so we're gonna make that look like that can he do it I don't know we'll see here we go all right we're moving right along here I'm um, I've started with the uh, power transformer and the uh, power cable and as you can see I've got the uh, equipment grounding conductor on this first uh, leg here this first uh, terminal and this thing's grounded and then uh, the neutral primary on the second one the power cable comes in the hot leg comes in goes into the back of the fuse holder comes out of the top of the fuse holder the front um, goes into this switching uh, potentiometer I have and then out of the switching potentiometer back to the terminal tree and then that connects with the other primary on the power transformer and that's about where we're at right now so um thought I'd give a few tips I know um recently I've been uh, catching up on the, all the videos for, that uh, DLAP has done and um I had seen a, a few of his videos in the past, but um, I didn't really get into him, um, you know, when I was starting out. I uh, tended more towards other people like Uncle Doug and stuff, because uh, the D-Lab videos, the guy's got a goddamn end mill in his lab, and, you know, that I couldn't really relate to what he was doing. I mean, he's got a friggin' end mill, what, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? Um... But I've watched all the other videos from all the other guys, so I was looking for more stuff, and then um, I'm glad I uh, checked him out again, because uh, he's really, really good. He's excellent. His videos are awesome, and uh, end mills aside. Um, seems like a very nice guy, and he's a uh, Air Force veteran, so there you go. Anyway, um, seems like a lot of his videos, I mean, he this guy better be sending Mojo Tone a Christmas card every year. Because it seems like he fixes a lot of the uh, Mojo Tone kit builds that people try to do. And it's usually, you know, simple mistakes and, you know, basic electronics and electrical technician type stuff. So I thought I'd share a few tips when I thought of them. Um, as you're assembling an amplifier, you want to go along and check all your work. So we have our multimeter here. And I've got it in uh, continuity beep mode. And find yourself a good ground somewhere on the chassis and then use that every time because it's a known ground. And this is a, a known ground right here. As you can see. So for instance, for example, when I installed this terminal tree uh, before I installed any wires, soldered on any wires, this leg and this leg are connected to the uh, screws which is going through the metal chassis. So these are going to be used as grounding uh, points. So when I, after I install the tree, check it. And then also check to make sure nothing else is shorted to ground. All right, and like um, another thing when you install the uh, switch, make sure there's no continuity between the two legs when it's off and make sure there's continuity when it is. Another thing I also did was make sure you have no shorts to ground when you install, you know, something like your power cord hot to the uh, on-off switch, make sure that isn't shorted to ground. And then test the other side. Just simple stuff like that. Because if you don't check as you go along, you install a whole mess of stuff and then it's not working, you have no idea where to look, where the problem is, and you have to basically test everything, you know, and hope that you, you find it out. So uh, that's my tip for the day. Tip for the minute. Tip for the clip. Tip for the clip. And I hope that helps help someone out. All right, so we got the uh, primary all wired up. We're going to uh, wire up the secondary. 
And um, then we'll do something else after that. Hang tight. Okay, I got another tip for you here. So, in this uh, amplifier build, we're taking a uh, vintage amp. This thing was made in the 60s, I believe. And we're rewiring it. So, we took some leads like this, and we cut them shorter. And we're using a uh, new section of the conductor here. Now, these things have been sitting around for 30, 40, 50 years. And uh, oxidation gets on the wires. And um, oxidation will prevent solder from sticking to the wire. So get yourself some alcohol. It doesn't have to be 99%, but as high as percent as you can get. And um, clean off the, uh, the wires. Like so, with a Q-tip. Whatever you have handy. And then, which will also help, get yourself some flux. Can you see that? Probably not. Get yourself some flux, a little Q-tip, and uh, just moisten the, uh, the end of the wires with your flux. And then you want to tin them. So you take your soldering iron, and um, you just put a little bit on the soldering iron. You tin the tip of your soldering iron, and then we touch the tip of the wire and work our way back. And it should wick all into it. And you don't want to go take your hot tip of your soldering iron and go up to the insulator. Because if uh, this is cloth insulation, so it probably wouldn't burn. But this keeps, uh, if you do it like I'm doing here, we heat the tip and then push the solder back as the wire heats up. That'll keep you from burning your conductor. All right. All right, we got another tip. I'm just full of tips today, which is a nice change of pace because I'm usually full of shit. Alright. So, working on the heater wires. And there's two heater wires. This is from the 6.3 volt tap on the power transformer. And we generally like to twist the wires because of the way the electromagnetic field works. It um, helps to eliminate noise. And a fun way to do this is to get your power drill, stick them in the chuck. All right, and then very carefully. Twist them. And there you go, get yourself a twisted pair. Right. And I like to um, use two different colors instead of just two green wires or whatever. Uh, because on like 12AX7s, uh, pins 4 and 5 are connected together. And pin 9 gets the other wire. And I just like to keep, you know, if I have multiple 12AX7s, AYs, AUs, whatever, ATs. You know, let's say we'll use the orange wire for pins 4 and 5. I'll use the orange wire on every tube 4 and 5. I don't know if, I don't think you need to do that. And I don't know if there's any benefit for doing that, but it uh, makes me sleep better at night. Here we are, moving right along. Got all the heater wires hooked up. And you'll notice the 6X5 rectifier tube. So it shares the heater wires with all the other tubes. There's no separate 5 volt tap off your power transformer. But, uh, We'll look into that a little bit later. We have our equipment grounding conductor here on the first grounded lug. And then on the last grounded lug, we have the um, the two center taps. The heater center tap and the uh, high voltage center tap. Good times. Fun stuff. Tomorrow. All right. It's Monday night after work. I'm completely bushed. But we're going to soldier on. Let's see where we're at here. Um, just kind of putting the components in. A temporary uh, layout. Just to make sure everything fits. And just to get an idea of where everything's going to go. And we're going to try and make this neat and clean. For a change. Get our uh, output transformer. Uh, secondary output. Whatever. Uh, 4, 8, and 16 ohm taps. Plus the ground. We've got our filter caps. I'm going to stick here. 
Got all our heater wires all heater wired up. This is the indicator lamp. I got this um, terminal tree in. That's going to be this thing here. And I think I'm going to need one more little one. Or maybe not. We might use the grounds on the uh, tube sockets. But, um, so anyway, yeah, that's where we're at. It's time to put the little bits in here and uh, finish her up. Here we go. We're hunting wabbits. That is a lot of sparrow poop right there. They'll demolish a full container in a morning. We go through like a 25 pound bag of bird seed in a week. And the tone nun doesn't get the cheap stuff, she gets the good stuff. One day I was sitting over here, right here, it's a tone pet. And <clears throat> this is a family of mice that live under the fence right there, underneath the bird feeder catching seed that falls down. Sitting right here. And a red-tailed hawk came screaming down, grabbed the mouse, and then took off. Good thing they didn't grab the tone pet. He'd make a nice morsel. Okay, now we're going to move on to probably my least favorite thing to do, which is to wire the input jacks on our amplifier. So I was watching a bunch of D-Lab videos, and he's got a bunch of videos um, where he fixes people's, um, like, Mojo Tone um, 5B3 Deluxe kits that they botched. And pretty much every single one of them, one of the problems people had were correctly wiring the input jacks. Um, which is understandable. Um, for the longest time, and until recently, this was like magic to me. And I think a lot of people take things that are considered simple for granted and, you know, don't lay out the information, you know, in an easy way so people can get their head wrapped around it. You know, I had some questions about this. I had no idea what the hell was going on here. And I tried Google searching and uh, asking questions on forums, and it just seemed like people assumed that it just was simple and made sense. But, you know, sometimes it doesn't. You don't know what you don't know. All right, so anyway, now on here, there are three parts to this switch. There is the tip, which is your hot signal. There's the sleeve or the ground. And there's also this third thing here, this arrow. That is a shorting jack. Now, these jacks here, regular quarter-inch jack, but they have three lugs on them. And this is not to be confused with a stereo jack that actually has two tip-looking things, these triangular parts here, that uh, dig into, you know, the tip of your jack. And this is actually a stereo one, so you can see where the tip, this long one, triangular part, connects with the tip, and this part connects with the sleeve. Um, but that's not what we want. It should only have one tri long triangular part. And then inside of that is another piece of metal that by spring action is touching, butting up and touching the tip. That's the shorting jack. And then finally, you have the ground. And you can see the ground is on top here. This big piece of metal is connected to the, the tab and it's also connected to the, you know, the whole body, the rest of the metal of this jack. That's how you can tell which lug is the ground very easily. And if you look at this middle one, you can see it runs under the first pancake and comes back up on this inside tab. And then by process of elimination, you've got your hot lug right here, or your tip lug. Uh, let me get a better jack so as to not confuse anyone. All right, here's a regular quarter-inch TS or tip sleeve jack. So... What happens here, this is basically like a normally closed switch. Now I have the multimeter in continuity mode, so no I don't. Now I do. This continuity, it'll beep. So if we put one 
guy here on the ground lug, you can see there's continuity to the sleeve. If I put them on the middle one here, the shorting lug, you can see it has continuity to the shorting tab or the inside piece of metal, but it also has continuity to the tip. And what happens is when you insert your jack, it pushes the triangular part back and these two pieces no longer touch each other. So now there is no longer continuity or a path for the signal to go between the shorting lug, the inside piece here, and your hot. And then when you pull it out, they squeeze back together and now there's continuity again. So that's how that works. Let's look at the layout here, see if we can make some sense of this. So right here is our bright high and bright low inputs. And we can see we have a one meg resistor and they're using the leg to connect to both the ground and the shorting lugs. Here's our one meg resistor and this dot here means there's a, there's a connection and it's connected to the ground and the shorting lug. That's what this arrow means that's pointing to the tip. You can think of that as a, like that little piece of metal with a dimple on, on it that is touching the tip. Okay, so one meg resistor connected to both ground and short. One meg resistor, ground and short. And then the other side of the resistor goes to the, um, the tip or the hot pin. And this whole section right here is the hot pin, and we can see our one meg resistor is connected there. Now if we look at the other one here, we have a 68K connected to the shorting jack, which is also connected to that one meg resistor. 68K connected to the other shorting jack, because this, this arrow is pointing at the other jack. So it's got it's connected there and it's also connected to a 68K resistor. Then on the tip, we have a 68K resistor. This is the tip, 68K resistor. And then finally, on the bright channel low jack, there's nothing connected to ground. And as you can see, there's no ground symbol here. So the ground gets nothing. All right, let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. So let's say we're in the bright channel, we plug into the hijack. Plug our plug in, and that lifts this jack, and that separates your tip from the shorting jack. So there's no longer a straight path to ground. But it does have a path this way through the one meg resistor to ground, but also has an easier path through the 68K resistor to the grid of your first preamp tube. But since it is also connected to the other jack shorting lug, it can go this way, but it will also go this way through this 68K resistor. So it takes two paths. It goes this way, and it also goes this way. Now you unplug it from the high and you plug it into the low that separates this from the tip so it has no path this way it can only go this way through one 68k resistor and then into your preamp tube does that all make sense i hope that cleared it up a little bit I, it's very convoluted and it's you know that's why it's understandable that it uh you know gives so many people so much trouble including myself anyway an easy way to wire these guys up is i uh, cut out a piece of cardboard i stuck it be behind the holes where all these jacks are going to go it's actually going to be like this this is facing out and so we're going to flip this over and we're going to wire it like this sort of like wiring uh, pots on a guitar so we'll be able to turn these any way that makes sense and add all our components. And then when that's all set, we'll just take this out as one big assembly and pop it into the chassis of the amp. All right. 
hopefully that uh, helps someone. All right, here's the back side of our little jig. And I've labeled everything. So it'll be very easy to just follow the layout. If you follow the layout, you shouldn't have any problems. You don't even need to understand it. It should just work. All right, let's do it. So uh, I got the amp upside down here, but uh, that's where the jacks are going to go. Hopefully you can see all that. Let's get some light on the scene. Um, these 68K resistors, you know, ideally on a point-to-point -point build would go straight to the tube sockets. But, um, you know, my resistors are not that long. So we're going to have to add a uh, terminal tree in there somewhere. But we'll put this thing together. And then we'll see where we can uh, put the terminal tree, and then we'll just run some wires. So it'll be a point-to-point-to-point -to -point -to -point build. To wire our jacks, we need two 1 meg resistors and four 68K resistors. Um, on the videos I watched from the D-Lab, another common mistake the uh, Mojo Tone kit builders uh, made was using the wrong value resistor. And as you can see, the values are encoded in those color bands. And I'll show you a very easy way to figure out those uh, color band codes so you don't make a mistake. The easiest way to figure out the color bands on resistors is to use a multimeter. 68K. And it's, a, it's very good practice to um, measure your, especially your resistors, but your components as you go so you don't make a mistake. I. All right, here's one pair of jacks wired up in our, our uh, jig here. And the other one's around here somewhere. Here she is. All right, so now we're going to pop these into the chassis. We'll add a um, terminal tree to uh, land all these guys, and then we'll run wires to V1. All right, we got the jacks installed. There they are. Looking pretty jacky. They're all jacked up. So what we need to do here is, um, we have four 68K resistors that we need to land somewhere. And these two need to go to one spot, and then these other two need to go to one spot. So we need a tree with two lugs. And um, each lug will then have a wire going to the separate uh, grid triode grids of the V1, 12AY7. So, uh, yeah, let's put a tree in. Let's plant a tree. We have the terminal tree installed, and we have our 468K resistors landed on that tree. And... A great place to uh, pick up extraneous noise in a uh, guitar amplifier is from your input jacks into the grid of V1. So it is good to use shielded cable. And I was watching D-Lab again, and he mentioned he uses RG-174. And I found a spool of it online, but it would have taken like a week or more to get. So I bought this guy right here. It's a um, extension cable, looks like a um, mini coax or whatever, uh, but it is made with RG-174. So we'll just cut the ends off and we'll use this. All right, let's do that. Here's the length of our shielded cable. It has an inner wire with insulation, and then wrapped all around that insulation is an outer shield of wire. And when you connect the shield, the shield goes to ground, but only on one end. So, this is going to be the wire that goes to the 268K resistors on the terminal tree. And then we'll connect this, the outer shield, to ground. But on the other side, we will not connect the shield to ground. We will only connect the inner wire that is uh, running our signal from the input jacks. So, I'm going to tin these up and install them. Day three. All right, we're back. Tuesday night. After work, bushed, soldiering on. Um, we got our wires installed, our coax or uh, shielded wires installed. 
and now I'm just kind of putting in the components in the general area that they're going to go to see how this is all going to work out. And then after that, I think the next step here is to um, put all the leads where they're going to go and all the terminals and lugs and stuff where they're going to go and uh, not solder them, but just, uh, you know, wrap them up, get the mechanical support and uh, do a temporary layout. And if that all works, then we'll go back and uh, do the final step where we solder everything up. Alright, here we go. Alright, I got the power supply all squared away. Dropping resistors, high tension lines. Hopefully that is all good to go. This has been quite the learning experience. This is my first point-to-point -point build from, from scratch, building a clone. Clonish amp. And uh, what I've been doing actually is, um, like this guy for instance, I need to go back and add a uh, coupling capacitor on there. So I just kind of just put a teeny tiny little bit of solder in Let's get Mr. Pointer over here. Just put a little teeny tiny dab of solder on there to keep them stuck as I made the bends and other connections. And uh, hopefully that'll work out. Yeah. Get a shot from this angle. What are the odds that this thing works the first time I fire it up? In this video, we're going to go over money line bets. Put your chips down now. That's essential equipment right there. I tell you what. Day four. We're back at it. Wednesday night, after work, bushed, soldiering on. Um, what did we do yesterday? Power supply, all the high tensions hooked up, I think. I hope. We'll find out when we fire it up. Uh, what are we going to do today? Uh, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We're just kind of winging this. Uh, probably should have just made a montage, taken pictures as I progressed and made a montage. That way, you know, I wouldn't try to find something compelling to say. But, um, in lieu of that, uh, just pretend, you know, I'm compelling and entertaining and informative. But, uh, anyway, here's a schematic. We're going to put uh, this shit in here, and hopefully it works. Coupling capacitors. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, Tom, Tom Pet thinks that's a good idea. So, uh, yeah, let's do that. All right, here's some compelling content right here. So on these point-to-point uh, -point builds, you kind of need to be real creative on uh, how you install all this junk. Um, and again, I am not an expert on this stuff. Um, if you're looking for expert uh, building advice, you've come to the wrong place, I fear. But anyway, if you're still with us, I'm working on this guy here, the cathode resistor and bypass cap for the uh, V1. Both cathodes share the resistor and capacitor. So we look at our layout, and what they did is they used the leg of the 820 ohm resistor to go through both pin 3 and pin 7, connecting those. And then in the other side goes the ground. And then they had the bypass capacitor connected to pin 3. And then it goes to ground. So I originally was trying to do that. I wanted the uh, resistor leg to go through these two uh, lugs on the uh, tube socket. And then I was going to send it to ground. You know, I was going to uh, connect the grounded uh, lug here, even though it doesn't have an eyelet up here. Was going to uh, I'm going to run a jumper from that hole to whatever I need to, however it ends up. But it wouldn't reach with the resistor, so I ended up using the capacitor, which has longer leads. And he's going from pin 3 to pin 7, or pin 8, whatever it is. What is it? I don't want to give false information here. Pin 8. Where are you? Pin 8. Pin 3 to pin 8 uh, with the capacitor and then we're piggybacking our resistor like so and then once we got most of the uh, components installed we'll figure out exactly where on this uh, terminal strip we want to stick them to ground them how's that for compelling content we used up a spool of flux so we have to reload this 
what I was using, and I, I liked it a lot. Ostor 6337 blend, uh, one millimeter, two percent flux. This is also 6337 blend, one millimeter, and it has 1.8 percent flux. Also made in China. So uh, we'll see how this works. More to come. While we're talking about supplies here, we got some wick. Um, one of these is the cheapest one I could find on Amazon. I think the other one was something that just came with a cheap soldering iron that I bought a million years ago. And then I uh, spent the money on this stuff here. SW No Clean SD Solder Wick Chemtronics. This um, is pre-fluxed and it's very convenient to use. Doesn't make a huge mess. Works very good. This stuff here that doesn't come pre-fluxed, uh, you have to um, get your little bottle of flux out and a Q-tip and add flux to it every time you want to use it. And it's a little bit messier, but I think it actually works a little bit better than this stuff, if I'm being honest. But again, it's messy and it's labor intensive adding this stuff. So uh, we've been using this and having great results. Hopefully we won't need it here, but there you go. Eventually. It's Friday. Yeah, baby. After work. Bushed. Soldiering on. I've been playing the home game. You may be asking what happened to Thursday. Um, I didn't do a whole lot of work yesterday. Uh, I did the night before because I couldn't... I, I woke up real early, couldn't get back to sleep. So I basically got all the crap that's supposed to be in here in here. Um, but I did make a little short clip yesterday. But I um, had some musings about, you know, my thoughts on stuff related to YouTube and whatever, and I listened back to it, and I don't think they would be received in the manner which I intended them, so I'm going to keep them to myself, or maybe I'll make a separate video, just so I uh, won't have people saying stay in your lane, but uh, yeah, here we go, everything's in its spot, I need to go back and check all the uh, solder connections, um, because I didn't do every one, and some of them are just tacked in there, so I'm going to go through it. Make sure all the solder is soldered correctly. Um, there's some legs I need to clip on some, like that guy there. Yeah, I don't even think he's soldered. So we'll do a, a nice once-over with the, um, you know, technical installation stuff. And then I'm going to go back again, and we'll get a nice, fresh schematic. And where's that shadow coming from? Holy shit, who's doing the lighting in this video? Fuck. Um, yeah, fresh schematic, and we'll get a nice yellow uh, Sharpie, and we will systematically go through the circuit to make sure uh, everything's where it's supposed to be, and look for any potential problems uh, before we fire her up. Oh, hey, did we talk about the uh, rectifier tube? Uh, if we did, I'll edit this out, but if not, I'll leave it in. Uh, so the regular Fender Deluxe as a 5Y3GT rectifier tube and off of your power transformer you have you know the high voltage two leads for high voltage you have two leads for the heaters of all your uh, tubes other than the rectifier tube but you also have a separate 5 volt tap or winding for your rectifier tube now this uh, Grom's kit um, did not have a 5 volt winding. It only has the 6 volt winding. And the Grom's kit uses a. What the hell is it? Uh, whatever it is, 6Y3. Um, 6X4, 6X, 6X5. And 
instead of the uh, the five volt winding going to the heaters, it uses the uh, regular six volt windings that go to all the other tubes as its heater. And it also has an interesting pinout. I think I drew it. Yeah. Okay. So you can see here on a on the five Y three, you got your two leads for your plates, and you have two leads from the five volt winding going to your heaters, and then off of one of those. You get your uh, high voltage to all your crap in your amplifier. So four four lugs basically on the back of the tube. On the 6X5, you got your two plates, your two heaters, and then it has, or it appears to be, I've never used one of these before, so we're going to find out if this is true or not, or if what I'm saying is correct. But it has a separate cathode lug on pin 8 that we're going to use, like right here going to power all our junk so uh, a little bit different there but uh, I think it should work should be fine and the reason I picked you know a Tweed Deluxe is other than the different rectifier tube it has the same tube complement the Groms does has the same tube complement you know what I mean all right hope that's helpful here we go let's wrap this sucker up I really gotta wonder about myself sometimes all that time and attention and care we spent on these uh, input jacks and I um, connected our 68k resistor to the, the damn ground lug like a buffoon and there's nothing on the hot lug <laughs> um, yeah just this guy over here one of these guys all right so we're gonna fix that all right here we go here's the moment of truth got the amplifier plugged into the current limiter which is plugged into the variac uh, I think that's off screen. Oh, no, you can see it. it's right here. Uh, maybe you'll even be able to read the, the uh, meter on the Variac. We've got Mr. Multimeter here. Got a um, speaker hooked up. Got a guitar plugged in. Gonna fire this sucker up for the first time. Let's see what happens. All right, so we got normal volume, bright volume, tone, and the tone also acts as an on off switch. So I'll turn it on and put the tone like in the middle. Volumes are all the way down. Variac is on zero. We'll turn him on. And we're just going to very slowly dial her up a little bit. And let's see what happens. Now, the meter will, won't turn on until I get to about 40 volts. So, I'm going to very carefully watch the current limiter. If that starts glowing, then we know that, you know, there's a short to ground somewhere. My current limiter only starts glowing when um, 500 milliamps of current is being drawn, and that's probably going to be the end point at full power with this. So if this thing starts glowing before 120 volts is being inserted, then there's a, there's a problem. But uh, anyway, here we go. Sure. The uh, indicator lamp's coming on, so that means our heater line is heating, I guess. All right. Got this in uh, AC voltage. We're going to uh, test the voltage on the AC line, see what we got going on there. And about a volt, which is about right for uh, where we're at now on this thing, which is 40 volts from the wall. So that looks good. Indicator lights on. This is not glowing. Uh, usually takes around 80 to 90 volts from the wall before the rectifier tubes start conducting and we'll be able to pass a signal through there. So let's go a little higher. Uh, DC voltage. See what we have uh, coming off the rectifier tube. Oh, I heard the speaker click. About 195 volts. Go into the uh, first filter cap. Let's see what we got here. Oh yeah. Oh, how about that? Son of a gun. Miracles do happen. Oh, 
I forgot we're in uh, Black Crow's tuning. continue to dial it up and just test voltages here in a little bit of static and a little bit of frying bacon here and there yeah hearing some noise so we'll check to make sure there's no DC getting on to where there should only be AC yeah something's cooking may have uh, overheated you know one of the carbon comp resistors or something like that so we'll just play around and um, Troubleshoot what uh, hopefully will just be a couple little problems, but son of a gun, first try, baby. I'm not some hack out there with just some soldering iron and a meter following uh, instructions he found on some internet forum. The first thing I'm going to try, I think, is um, replacing the tubes, swapping the tubes out, because that's easier to do. And uh, those are some old crusty tubes, so they might have some old crust in them. But uh, still at 85 volts, but yeah, she sounds pretty nice. And also, I think um, possibly the rectifier tube's not supposed to be used in the horizontal uh, way. But uh, you gotta do what you gotta do. All right, hang tight. All right, I swapped out all of the tubes except for the rectifier tube. That's the only 6X5 I have. It's a uh, vintage RCA. But I have two modern 6V6s, tongue saws. I have a Electro Harmonics, brand new 12AY7, and a uh, brand new Mullard 12AX7. Uh, got her dialed up to, whatever that says, 91 volts. So a little bit higher than we were before. And with this tube set, it's definitely uh, doesn't have as much gain. So the vintage tubes are really kicking out the jams. Um, but we still uh, seem to have a lot of background noise. You can hear that. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's not too bad. I don't know. Anyway, I tested all the voltages and everything seems to be very reasonable. So, uh, yeah, I'll let her burn in for a little bit and just keep uh, creeping the voltage up higher and higher until we get to the, uh, get to 120 anyway. Um, and see what happens. Wish me luck. All right, continuing on with our shakedown trial here. I just uh, tried out all four input jacks. Uh, they all work. I'm in the uh, bright side now. I was in normal before. I'm in the bright side high. And uh, this channel seems to, uh, to not have the background noise, so I think that helps that, you know, cuts down 50% of the uh, possibilities of where we might be getting that noise from. But uh, yeah, she sounds pretty nice. Yeah, whatever. Pete Townsend, I'm not. Tone knob works uh, fabulously. And the uh, channels are interactive. Um, it's not a huge difference. It's sort of like adding in a little bit of negative feedback. I don't even know if you're going to be able to tell on the uh, recording here. So I got the uh, bright volume halfway up and the normal volume all the way down. I'll add some of the normal volume in, go halfway. Basically, it compresses it, and when you uh, turn the other channel's volume that you're not using all the way up, it really squashes the signal. But yeah, sounded good. All right, I'm going to continue on. I'm at a hundred and like five or six volts right now. I'll go all the way up, and uh, if it's, everything's good, uh, we'll find a, a speaker and a cab for this thing, and uh, 
You know, really test it out. Couldn't be happier. Crank the Variac up to 120 volts, and she sounds great, even with this uh, crappy uh, crate bench speaker we got here. Um, check the bias real quick. Here's the uh, the math. Max plate dissipation on a 6V6 GT is um, 14 watts, and we're at 11.75. And uh, we don't do 70% because we're cathode bias, so we can go right up to the max. So we're a little under 14. But once we take her off the current limiter, that's going to grow. So, yeah. Freaking nailed it. Look at that. You don't have one of these. How cool. I'm going to call this a uh, almost complete success. We got to track down the uh, little bit of static we're getting in the normal channel. But, um, again, I think it's just I probably overheated one of the resistors or... You know, it's something stupid, but we'll track it down. We'll figure it out. Um, I imagine this video is already going to be about six hours long. And I know everybody, you know, thoroughly enjoys really long YouTube videos. But um, I'm going to cut it here. And um, I'll find a cab with a nice speaker in it. And then we'll throw her on the rumble dyno and um, see if she rumbles. So thank you for watching, everybody, especially those who made it this far all the way through. Hope you learned something. I certainly did. It's my first point-to-point -point build, first time using carbon comp resistors, first time painting um, with the color purple. Look at that. Come on. Stop it. Stop it. You guys have got to give me a thumbs up. I'm sorry. I hate asking for thumbs ups on YouTube, but God damn. All right, so uh, hopefully you come back to see if this amp rumbles. Will it rumble? All right, rock on, dudes and dudettes. Done! While I was editing the video, I saw why I was getting static and noise in the normal channel. The cathode bypass cap here on pin 3 is not soldered. That'll do it. Details matter.